Hvor skal jeg kigge hen? Ja, vi snakker. Jeg starter med kameraet. Sorry. Uh, welcome back to the studio. This will be the last uh, of the Epic TV interviews in uh, 2023. Uh, there will hopefully be another option in 2025 in Lyon. We don't know, but hopefully. Uh, and we are ending off with uh, quite a cherry on top of the cake here. I have uh, Professor Thomas Graven Nielsen in the studio. Uh, full disclosure, Thomas was my PhD supervisor uh, and we still are collaborators. So I'll be asking him all the questions that I couldn't do uh, when the screen is not on. Anyways, Thomas, thank you for joining us. Welcome. Uh, you, you have a long-standing interest and, and research career within pain, but maybe you want to just tell us about your own background before we go into what you're doing? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm a uh, professor in pain neuroscience, and right now we have this Center of Excellence where we study characteristics around the pain system and we have a particular interest in understanding the neuroplastic manifestations in the pain system and in particular in humans to see what we do then. Obviously we are fairly restricted, uh, this is humans, we cannot look at neuronal recordings uh, but we can start to make models. We can make models and we can start to provoke manifestations, we can probe them and we can also start to modulate that. And, and it, uh, we'll, we'll be talking more about those models, but before we do that, what, what, sort of, what were your trajectories? So I, know, I know some of the early studies you've done and you were, you were looking at uh, doing something to either patients or to healthy volunteers mm -hmm. that induces pain. So mm -hmm. let's say in a, in a healthy person, you do something to them that induces pain. Mm -hmm. Why is that relevant? Because that person doesn't have pain. So no, why that, is that relevant? No, that's completely right. But, but the, the major problem we have in our world in general is that we don't know how the patients were look, looking before. So we, we don't know anything about the reaction patterns before at baseline. So that's why it's, it's, it's actually really important that we start to use some of these models. We started with very basic pain models where we only had pain for 30 seconds, for example. Then over years it ended up with 10 minutes of pain and nowadays we have pain for 10 days, for example. We can have models doing that. And so just because I, I know you've been doing this so long and I understand what you're saying, but I think if, mm -hmm. if you haven't been doing this type uh, of research, then a model would mean that it's, it's something you do to... To mimic what, is, what we see a manifestation with, that we eventually see in, in patients. So a good example is, is for example, when uh, we see patients and they may have a clinical problem in the anterior tip muscle, then often they have referred pain to the ankle. And there we have developed models where we induce pain in the anterior tip muscle and we can then see these referred pain patterns. So that then we mimic what the healthy system would like to react like. Um, so, and then, so learning from the patients and yeah, what they say yeah, we and try to, trying to do exactly, that. Exactly, we try to mimic what we see in patients. Um, what is very important is what we see in patients is, is have, will have a, a very difference in the time perspective. I mean, patients would have pain in weeks or months, but we can only do pain for 10 days. But what is interesting is that we can actually see the similar changes. Uh, again, coming back to this, uh, this model with pain in the anterior tip muscle, then for example, if we look at patients with low back pain, we have actually shown that they show in large pain areas now, when we stimulate them. And when we induce pain in healthy subjects and they have pain for several days, then they also start to enlarge the pain area. So we have this dynamic. And, uh, and there's, there's essentially there'll be two ways to see if the area where, where they experience pain is, is changing. One would be to ask the person and the other one would be to, to test how they respond to, for instance, a pinprick or yeah. Is, is that what you mean? Yeah, that's also the classical approach, right? I mean, we can also then start to probe the system with different models. And, and we have had an interest in using this, um, well, temporal summation of pain assessed with a cuff ergometry, where we can use a big cuff mounted around the leg and we can control that in an elegant way. Uh, so we look at uh, relative changes over time. We can, then we can do repeated stimulations, for example. Have, we have done that with pinprick and many other things, heat as well. But here we have a much more controlled model. We can do the same thing, for example, with descending inhibitory control, the conditioning pain modulation. Again, we are using the same technology. And, but, but the trick here is that we actually look at relative measures. It's not just pain thresholds between subjects. It is 
relative changes, and that's the strength of, of and, this. And again, this is uh, since I was I was a late bloomer into basic science. I, I understand why people may not see this clearly. Mm -hmm. So so if I can try and elaborate, and you can tell me if I'm on the right track here. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the conditioned pain modulation paradigm, where we where what we do is we give a person a stimulus with the cough maybe around the leg and they say it takes so much pressure for me to feel this much pain mm -hmm. and then we do something that conditioning stimulus as it were which could be another cough on the other leg or it could be cold water or it could be something else that is tonic or you know continuously painful for a period of time and then we do the same thing to this leg mm -hmm. and now it takes this much pressure or that much pressure so mm -hmm. there's a change that mm -hmm. it can mm -hmm. either be easier to induce pain or harder to induce pain. And that's exactly the relative change. Uh, and this is a reflection of how well will the brain try to downregulate the incoming nociception. Uh, and that, that's, that's a, a system that we have known in, for many years that is impaired in patients, for example. And that's why it's interesting to look at this. And, and, and just because I, I know, this is, as you said, this has been going on for many, many years. And I think there was a at a point where we, where we thought that we could do that on a patient and then maybe have sort of a standard value or normative value, so either the patient was more or less compared to that. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that's not exactly how we see it anymore? The way that we see it today is still on group values and group levels, so there we can see these changes. We have a huge variability. And we had a session yesterday actually on, on translational pain research where we had a long discussion of, on variability and I was somehow uh, supposed to be against this variability but actually I'm very much in favor of the variability because I think we can learn a lot. I think if we start to understand if there's any traits around who will have a lot of variability or who's actually reacting with a very strong modulation or less modulation, I'm, I'm convinced this could say something about the system. And, and there are some interesting studies coming out from Australia where they're looking at other parameters, but that's also a matter of how much they try to adapt. Yeah. And this adaptability is actually indicating um, who will become chronic pain patients. This was in sub, uh, subacute low back pain patients that they looked at this variability, not with CPM, but with other measures. So I think it's, it's really interesting with the variability because that could be a key to understand what is what is, what is explaining parts of the chronification? So, so instead of thinking that we are measuring uh, a specific thing, we are, as you say, measuring something that is relative and mm -hmm. we're just about learning what that really means. Mm -hmm. And maybe actually people are different, we know they're different, and maybe the person within themselves, maybe in different conditions or in mm -hmm. different situations could be different as well. Mm -hmm. So instead of that being a set like almost like a trait, like a personality mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. it could actually be situational. Yeah, and could. we could use that as, as what we refer to as a proxy yeah, for studying something that is otherwise invisible. Mm -hmm. it, and what I, Yeah, exactly. And what I also think is interesting that, that this could be go across different domains if we like. We could have the somatosensory area, but we could also have the, the more psychological area. And there we all see exactly the same thing, but the subjects and participants will react differently to different situations. Catastrophizing, for example. Yeah. I mean, that's also a matter of how, how well do we react to a given situation. So, and that's something I think the future will bring us to understand what is, is it a trait that some subjects will react better or more uh, restricted? Um, I don't know, but that's a theory uh, yeah. for sure. And, and in a very simple design, what we could do is we could test a group of people and see how they respond individually, give them maybe a treatment, that could be exercise or something, and then we could do it again. That's a design mm -hmm. that's been used uh, many times. And then we can see how does exercise change this relative measure. Exactly. And maybe there's a subgroup who benefits more. Mm -hmm. So we can see by the proxy that they, they seem to be better. And we can ask the person, of course, are they feeling better? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, how, that's sort of what we can do. And, and in this case, we are, I think you would refer to it as probing the system. Yeah, exactly. And then I know you, you, you have, you've got this, this huge funding that also tests how can we change the system, yeah, modulate that's it. That's right. Well. I mean, all all our activities in, in our uh, center, Center for Neuroplasticity and Pain, they, they are kind of structured around a model where we look at neuroplasticity and we try to, as I said, provoke and probe 
So that's what we have discussed now, but also how can we modulate that? And of course, modulation can be a million different things. Um, what we try to look into now is more the, uh, the cortical reactions patterns, because we know that a lot of things can change, uh, and perhaps we can link this to the variability we just discussed on many different levels. And, and we try to, to look for many different types of modulations. Maybe, uh, maybe just first say, so cortical would be the, the surface layer of the brain, essentially. Yes, but exactly. I, it could and, also be deeper structures, but right now when we, when, we, when we talk about brain stimulation, we talk about non-invasive brain stimulations. And, and of course, we can go a little bit deeper with that and also to other structures, but it's not going to be really deep. Of course, we can then look at some, some and, studies and, uh, where we can do uh, deep brain stimulation as well, but that's not something we can do in models. And I think this is, this is probably quite important for people listening if they're not familiar with what, what it means to do yeah. non-invasive stimulation. So, for example, you're not opening up the skull, uh, doing not something to the brain. I mean, we're talking about uh, healthy participants, so we cannot do a lot. But, but for example, what is called uh, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation that has been used in, in many different fields uh, to study the mode control system. It's a system where we can do magnetic stimulation to the motor cortex. You will see activity in, in that particular muscle that you somehow stimulate. So you can stimulate the brain in one side, and then you and can then see, you can the see thumb activity move exactly. Under the hand. Exactly. So that, that's that's what we can do and that's completely harmless and, and you know it's uh, safe and used in many conditions but what is interesting is that when we then repeat these stimulations then it can transfer into an intervention and this has been used for example in depression studies uh, where they, they can then stimulate with uh, TMS repeated TMS it's then called to to to, to help in, in a treatment uh, protocol can, can, I, can yeah. I ask a question here? This is, uh, this is actually a genuine question. I'm not trying to poke you. So, so we know that the people who experience pain, have, there's a, it's very complex. So there, there will be aspects of it that are not measured on a zero to 10 scale. So wh when we do the brain stimulation, is, it, is, there like a, is there like a paradigm we say, th this is the bit that we, is it the intensity of the pain we're trying to change or is it the responsiveness of I think, the system as mm, it were? I or? think it's the integration of everything and, and, and we cannot uh, separate it like that right now. For the, 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 the vast majority of studies on this has been on stimulations and motor cortex. Uh, and, and uh, to be honest, we don't know really why that's the case. Uh, evidence shows that this is a nice place, but from a somatosensory perspective, it, this somehow is not really uh, yeah, because clear. Because we, we would expect that you would stimulate the sensory cortex yeah, to, this, yeah, exactly. to affect pain, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, exactly. we're stimulating the motor cortex. Yeah, and, 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 but that's where we see a lot of effects. Uh, and, and, and for example, Professor Rohini Kuhn has demonstrated that there is also uh, valid connections. So, so it's, 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 it is still okay, I think. But that's the way we can start to stimulate that. And then there is some effects. But we can also stimulate uh, elsewhere, for example, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So that's where we are going into the more effective components. And, but it's, it's not, we have done a lot of studies, and it's not so that that's the magic bullet to stimulate that also. Perhaps it's a combination. And that's where we, we are right now, that we start to understand what does it take uh, to do these stimulations. So, yeah, and TMS so, is, is one thing, but we can also use what so, is... So, so we talked to, to Professor uh, Moayeti mm -hmm. uh, from, from Canada, and he was explaining in the old days how they would use EEG, these, these like bath helmets mm -hmm. with electrodes. So they were only measuring. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how do you know where you are in the brain? So, so can you talk us through how the setup is and, and mm -hmm. how do you create these electric impulses? Or magnetic for, for, for the motor cortex, it's fairly simple um, because there, as you said, you had the response. We know approximately the homunculus where, where we can stimulate and which muscles should then react. So that's that's fairly easy. Uh, and then we use an, a, a coil, uh, which is then you draw through a current in that one, and then you would have a magnetic field, and that's the magnetic field which will then stimulate the the upper layers of, of uh, motor cortex. Does cortics. it stimulate or does it inhibit? It so will stimulate, it will facilitate. So it, it I mean, and, uh, yeah, it will normally just stimulate. That's what, what is done. But that depends on the t intensity, of course. Um, so it leads to more action potential. Yeah, and because you excite these structures, and you then get the excitation in the muscle. And if you measure the muscle activity, you will see a very nice response in the particular muscle. 
when it then comes to the other, all the other structures, for example, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, then either you can take an, an, an imaging of a particular subject and we can then guide our stimulation based on that image. Uh, there you can see structures. And, and this can, would be M MRI? Yeah, so, MRI yeah. or functional MRI. Um, so that can be done, or you can use a, 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 an, an image based on a, a group of subjects, and that's what is normally used. And then we have some neuroimaging to know that we are stimulating the right place. So just, just hearing the words functional MRI or structural MRI, mm. for that sake, and, and these coils and all of that, mm. it sounds really expensive. So what, how do you justify using so many resources on something? Why, why, what could this end with? I mean, what's but, the big game here? The, the big game here is to, to see if we can eventually First of all, we use a lot of ED as well, and combine that with ED, ED the, the electrodes that you talked about, uh, the electroencephalography, um, as, as you also had other people talking about. Um, but we use that as well, but to measure and to stimulate the right places. So that's the perspective. We would like to see if we can see some of these variability changes uh, on something what, which is called brain oscillations, and then we would like to modulate that up and down. Uh, this is a little bit uh, sophisticated, but, but I mean, that's, that's brain oscillations is the concept making connections between different regions in the brain. So one could imagine that the connectivity between different brain regions, so how they connect, is, is really different in patients or when they have pain or something like that. And then stimulating that with either TMS or electrical stimulation, low intensity electrical stimulation, may be able to change that. Yeah, we, we, we had another interview with, with a, a good colleague of yours, Kirsty Bannister, and, mm -hmm. and, and her friend and colleague. Uh, 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 Shafak Sikha, mm -hmm. Shikanda, sorry, and uh, and they said so they're doing electrophysiology and they said we are wise enough not to go into the brain because it's so complicated. Yet you are doing exactly that. You are yeah. doing something. But I'm to not the brain. wise then. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I'm, so what, what's the? Is there a theory? Is like if if this happens, then that, or is it more explorative and see what happens when we do this? The thing is that what Kirsty Bannister, for example, is looking at is the descending control systems regulated per the brain spread, brain stem. What the only thing we can do from a non-invasive perspective is to look at the top-down control. I mean, from because we know that the, the cortical structures will also control what is happening there, and that's the only thing we can do. I mean, I would love to be able to get closer to all the other structures, but I cannot do that. So that's just a kind of a prerequisite for, for my work, that I have to stay where I can do things. Um, yeah, there's, there's a simple limitation to it, yeah, yeah. as it were, but there, there might be changes. Mm -hmm. So if you could do anything, if, if, if there was the tools and you could do it, it wouldn't be invent invasive, it wouldn't be dangerous. Is there a place in the brain that you think is more relevant to study how the pe person with chronic pain is different from other people? Um, now, at many uh, uh, workshops here, I've actually argued for the fact that we need to combine the mental or psychological aspects with the more somatosensory aspects. So I think it will be to combine the more frontal regions with the more classical somatosensory regions and then look at what is happening there. And we have done studies where we have looked at how is this connectivity changed between those structures in pain and they are changed in our models and they are also changed in some pain, uh, sorry, in pain patients. Um, but what is really difficult here is that then we have uh, the full spectrum of combinations of uh, depression and all the other things um, and we don't know what is what here. Uh, so so uh, just, just really following that line of thought, could it could it be, let's say, uh, there's, a, there's a range of things we can do to modulate, and essentially what we think when we are modulating mood, for instance, or pain for that sake, we, we think we're doing something or the person is doing something in their brains, although maybe that wouldn't explain it all, it's definitely part of it, we would, we would say that. And, and um, psychedelics mm -hmm. do some of that, uh, we believe that psychotherapy does some of that, we believe exercise does it, and, mm -hmm. and brain stimulation does it. Mm -hmm. So following your line of thought, would it be viable, in, in your expert opinion, to use this like psychedelics and exercise and stimulation to have a better outcome? 
you, do, so more intense, more uh, modulative outcome, do you think? I, I think I would be wise enough not to talk about psychedelics here, but modulation of any affective components, that would be interesting to take from a psychotherapeutic approach and then look at what is then the effect of traditional mechanisms. I think that's, that's really interesting. And there has been some studies where they have modulated that and they can then see effects in some of the more classical somatosensory processing of, of nociception. So, so there's a strong link here. Um, so almost like, like the proxy we talked about before, but yeah. instead of having a proxy for stimulation of the nervous system, it would be a proxy for stimulation of perception. Of, yeah, exactly, or, or, or mood, for example. I yeah. mean, if you start to uh, manipulate on that. The, the trick is, of course, to understand in the individual patient, where should you go? Should you go for the, something classical in the, in the in somatic central system, or is it more like in the other ball game? Yeah. And that's, that's, we don't know. But perhaps we will be able to get closer to that. But, but an ex example here is coming back to this conditioning pain modulation where we actually tried in healthy subjects to, to look at conditioning pain modulation and we then on the top of that we modulated the, uh, the, the, the effective component, the mood, simply by, by showing some nice photos and very uh, scary photos. And, and you could easily see changes there, so there is an effect. So if you show some very pleasant pictures, then the CPM is, is working a little bit better. But if you really give them uh, some strong effective components, then it's, it's less effective. So there is some interesting things. And if we can then obtain the same thing, and we can actually do that with electrical stimulation as well on the brain, very low intense, it's, it's not uh, painful or anything. But if we do that, we can see similar effects. So, so we can start to, to manipulate on that. Do you, think, do you think, again, following the same sort of line of thought here, could it, could it be that for some people who don't respond very well to medication, do you think brain stimulation could facilitate absorption or usefulness mm -hmm. of, Definitely. for instance, gabapentinoids or something like that? I, th I think for sure it, it's interesting to use these uh, treatment windows uh, and, and perhaps Perhaps these brain stimulations will not necessarily give a full effect, but then combined with the classical, for example, uh, normal um, uh, manipulation or whatever, I don't know. Uh, but, and also pharmacological treatment, but, but you know, that's still fairly unspecific. Uh, so, so I think, I don't see, I don't see uh, uh, non-invasive brain stimulation as the only thing. It's probably an additive uh, thing. Uh, yeah. We still need to understand what is the time perspective of this. My colleague, uh, Daniel Cambier-Diandrade, he's done a lot of studies on stimulation and inpatients. And there it seems that you have, need to have a series of stimulations over days, and then it will keep its effects for a longer time. And we, st we still need to understand what is actually happening in that process. And I think what's happening is when people like yourself goes about really systematically testing these things, we get further away from the simple ideas of stimulate the brain and then depression goes away. Mm -hmm. But it's not an unuseful tool, but it's useful in a different way. Is that sort of what you're saying? Well, we, we don't, well, what, I think what I'm saying here is that, <laughs> that we need to understand what is the time perspective of, you, we make a modulation and that will have a certain time duration of yeah. effect and we need to understand what does that take because of course we cannot stimulate patients constantly, I mean that would look strange at least <laughs> uh, and, and not be very uh, feasible, but we need to understand this window because what is happening now in the system when the patient is then coming back to the normal condition. Yeah. And, and, and that's where we also do interesting new studies that we actually try to measure the brain activity and based on the brain activity, we try to do the stimulation in an intelligent way. So if these brain oscillations, as I talked about, is running a little bit slower, perhaps we, when we see this pattern, we can then do some stimulations based on that. So it's a, it's a matter of having a proxy to understand what should we then stimulate with and why. Well. Yeah. And I, I always get this, this sense of a metaphor. It's like looking through the keyhole of a door into a whole house. And the only way you can look into it is that keyhole. And then what I think you were doing, and, and this is not from what you're saying, this is from having you know, the pleasure of, of knowing you. you. You're looking for new doors, as it were, to have more keyholes, to look at the same thing from different angles and maybe build like a better 3D picture. 
Yeah, that, that's one perspective, but also using the keyholes to shoot at different structures from different perspectives. Yeah, so, uh, so we try and not, not just look at it, but actually try and change it and see yeah, how yeah, does that yeah, yeah. lead into better therapy, essentially. Exactly. And another thing, I mean, with the brain stimulation is that, you know, side effects for pharmacological treatment is an enormous uh, thing. Um, but for brain stimulation, it's... it's um, well, there's not that many side effects, so, so it's also a little bit more easy to use uh, without having uh, the cost of, of side effects. Yeah. So if, if you were looking out in, in the future, uh, ten, 10 years from now perhaps, what do you think all this you're doing will, will give us? <coughs> what will we know, do you think, or what are you hoping we will know? I, I hope that we will be able to, um, actually based on the variability in the system, being able to predict a little bit better who will go in the wrong direction and potentially have be more vulnerable to develop chronic pain um, if we see these patients or at a very early stage or perhaps before anything uh, perhaps we can do that and then i hope that we can actually take these patients with with higher vul vulnerability and then perhaps stimulate some particular structures uh, to improve the connectivity with brain oscillations and then hopefully I mean if we can predict they're going this, this direction perhaps we can also try to avoid that by stimulating and, and do things so and, that's that's the hope and this is probably the worst question for you but this is something I'd, I'd asked a lot of speakers about if you had all the money in the world but you almost have but if you were given even more money to do whatever you wanted what would be the thing that you think would be most important for people with chronic pain that is doable with the tools we have today, if funding was not an issue, and time and hands and resources? If we take this purely from the patient perspective, then I think we need to understand what are they, of course, looking for. And they're looking for a better quality of life, uh, not necessarily only pain intensity. So we need to make sure that we have the full package. But when that somehow dealt with, then of course they are looking for a treatment which is uh, having no side effects, and, and something which we can say that this is working, having a biomarker uh, saying that this is working with a very good uh, chance. And that's what we're looking for here. Uh, and, and, um, yeah, and, and that will take some relatively good long longitudinal studies uh, to follow patients, um, but it's not impossible at all to do. Uh, so I think that's something we can, we can work towards. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's my, my simple wish. <laughs> well, I, I think we should end the whole conference, at least the, the recordings here at the conference, with that simple wish. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can definitely mirror that, so that would be